So hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our safety webinar on maintaining a ratcheting strap hoist. My name is Gisela Clark and I'm the Senior Digital Marketing Specialist for Columbus McKinnon and will be your host for today's webinar. Presenting today will be Henry Bergena. He's the corporate trainer at Columbus McKinnon, specializing in rigging and load securement. Henry is a member of the tie down committee for the WSTDA. This committee writes the standards that are used by the trucking industry, which are also used by enforcement. Henry's been training on crane and rigging products and safety for more than 15 years. So Henry, if you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. So this is us, this is Henry and I'm Gisela. And we can show this at the end if you want to reach out to us for any reason. If you can forward to the next slide, please. So before we begin, just a couple quick things. Our webinar is recorded. And as I said, we're going to be posting the recording link to our YouTube channel. All in attendance today, we'll be receiving a link to the recording. Uh, you'll get it via a follow-up email. Everyone is in listen-only mode, so we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A pane on the right side of your page. We'll take five minutes at the end to answer your questions. And best of all, the best question turns into a blog post. And if your question is chosen, we will send you something after the fact, one of our promo items. So ask a lot of good questions and maybe you'll be featured in our upcoming blog post. Okay, so thank you for your attention. And now I'll turn the meeting over to Henry so that we can begin. Henry? Thank you, Gisela. And uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for attending. Uh, I hope you get some good information out of this. And as Gisela said, if you do have any questions, please ask them. All right. Uh, first of all, I just want to leave this disclaimer up there for, for a few seconds to just to let you know that uh, this is general information only. Um, you're the thing that you have to do as a user of any of this equipment is uh, you have an obligation to maintain it in accordance with uh, the applicable standards as well as OSHA um, regulations that apply to it. So uh, again, uh, this just obviously for legal purposes. Uh, so who's CM? CM's been around for a little over 140 years. Uh, we just celebrated our 140th anniversary. I think it was like a year or two years ago. Uh, and we are located in Getzville, New York, which is a town just outside of Buffalo. It's just north of Buffalo. So a uh, little information on us. We've been, like I said, we've been around for a very long time, specializing in, in lifting equipment, hoists, uh, chain, slings, uh, hooks, forgings, uh, crane components, things like that. This is a list of uh, some of the companies that uh, fall under the CM umbrella. Uh, you can see there's quite a few of them. And I'm sure some of them that you'll, you will recognize their uh, US-based companies as well as international-based companies, but they all fall under the CM umbrella. All right, so first, safety, hoist safety. Uh, lever tools are, are hoist. They're manufactured to a hoist standard, which we'll get into in a few minutes here. All right, there's three, three facets of hoist safety. A safe hoist, which is obviously the equipment that you're using, make sure it's maintained properly. Uh, the operator, using it safely. All right, if you have a brand spanking new hoist coming right out of the box uh, and the operator uses it in the wrong way, it's no longer a safe piece of equipment. Somebody's going to possibly get hurt or at least you're going to have it. You might have a, a near miss or even an accident. All right, uh, safe load. We're talking about there is is pretty much can the load uh, handle the stresses that you're trying to put on it as far as how you attach to the load. Uh, in a lot of cases, because we are talking about ratchet, ratcheting type uh, lever tools, a lot of them get used in the uh, um, the electric industry, the utilities, power lines, things like that. Um, those power lines are going to be subjected to forces just like the hoist is uh, or the lever tool is. So are those for forces going to be enough to damage the power line or literally rip it apart? All right, those, that's the third leg of the uh, hoist safety that we're talking about here. A look at load straps. Uh, they, they're they not a hot hoist. Um, a lot of people think, well, because it's made, it has a strap in there, the strap is non-conducting, I can use it when I have energized lines. That's not completely true. All right, make sure that if you are using a strap, uh, any kind of a hoist, whether it's a strap hoist or anything else, make sure that you're properly insulated from the power, all right? This comes directly out of our uh, 
manual for these components. It's a wet strap is not rated for insulating member, okay? When it's clean and dry, the strap may have a dielectric property. In other words, it may have some uh, properties that won't allow electricity to flow through. But when it gets wet or if it gets used a lot, gets dirty, you're going to start picking up components on there that will actually allow electricity to flow through the strap. All right, the handle is, uh, what is, the insul is one of the insulating members of this strap hoist. All right, the handle is usually fiberglass, uh, which is non-conducting, so it's not, doesn't, doesn't get a chance to get energized. Also, under OSHA, if you're working near power lines, all right, and you do have a lot of conductors around there, make sure that you follow the OSHA regulations when it comes to energized lines or whatever your company policy is. All right, I would, I would suggest using whichever one is stringent. Also, make sure that you're clothed the proper, uh, appropriately. Make sure that you have non-conducting gloves, rubber gloves of some kind, all right, that are really important. Make sure they're rated for the voltage that you're dealing with. All right, you don't want to wear a pair of gloves that are good for 10,000 volts if you're dealing with something that's 40 or 50,000 volts. Uh, they're not going to do you much good. All right, so like I said, lever hoists are hoists. They are manufactured under ASME B30.21 standard, all right? That, it, that standard is completely dedicated to lever hoists. Uh, it doesn't say anything else in there, anything to do with anything else other than the lever hoist itself. Some of the things that I'd like to also mention in here is some of the definitions. What do different things mean? All right, friction brake. It's an automatic type of brake used for holding and controlling loads. All right, it's it relies on the load to open and close that brake. So if I'm picking up 200 pounds of load with a lever with a lever hoist, I need that same 200 pounds to open the brake. All right, ratchet and pawl type systems, uh, they don't rely on the load uh, to open and close the brake because there really there is no brake in a ratchet and pawl system. All right, the pawl is the uh, uh, load mechanism that, that, that holds, or the, I'm sorry, the mechanism that holds the load. Qualified person, uh, just like it, the definition says, a person who by possession of a recognized degree or certificate of professional standing or who by extensive knowledge, training, and experience has successfully demonstrated the ability to solve or resolve problems. That's going to, you know, I'm, a lot of my classes, what I tell people, I says that's going to be, it's not going to be, it may be the person who's been there for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. You know, he, he's not the supervisor, but you know what? He's been there for a very long time. He's got a lot of good information. All right, talk to them. Make sure you can glean some of that information from them. They may also have a lot of uh, training behind them. You know, it may not all be uh, formal training, like I said, like uh, college level or trade school but it may be just training that they've gone to different companies to get specific training done on how to use a lever tool, how to use a hoist, how to use a crane, uh, how do I attach to, to high voltage lines. All right, that's, you know, that's what a qualified person is gonna be. All right, a load suspension parts, basically anything that carries the load in a lever tool is gonna be considered a load suspension part. Like the list here says, the hook, the chain, sprockets, uh, the structure of the housing, which supports the sprocket, the bearings uh, that support the sprocket as well, and of course the load block, uh, is, is, uh, which obviously would go without saying. All right, shall, it's a small word, there's only five letters, but it's very, 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 very important. All right, shall indicates that you have to do something. All right, it indicates that adherence to a particular requirement uh, is necessary to perform uh, in that standard. Okay, so there's when you read standards like ASME B30.21, they use two words a lot: shoulds and shalls. Shall means you have uh, really no choice but to do it. It's it has to be done. Uh, should is something that comes up that it's a recommendation. All right, and uh, the thing is is uh, with OSHA, what happens is what they they have the, what they call their general duty clause. Um, shoulds and shalls in OSHA don't exist. Uh, there are some 
regulations in OSHA that uh, are written and they do use the words should and shall and that sometimes confuses people because they know in standards when they say shoulds and shalls they mean two different things. When you have a federal document like OSHA and I'll, I'll also include this because I, I know I guess we got a few people here from Canada as well with CSA. If it's written in CSA or if it's written in OSHA, I don't care really how they word it, whether they use should or shall, you have to follow it, period. There is, there is no choice. Those documents are law, law. that's it. Um, everything else, the standards, uh, ASMEs, uh, CMAAs, or anything else out there, uh, they're all standards. Those are, those are uh, written by, uh, by engineers, people who attend these different groups, and that's why there's shoulds and shall. They really have no enforcement. OSHA, CSA, those are the enforcement people. All right, rated loads, the maximum load for, for which a hoist is designed by the manufacturer. Really, really important here is that the, it's designed by the manufacturer. If someone is using a hoist and uh, a lever tool, and that lever tool is good for a, a one-ton load, and somebody decides, well, it can handle, you know, 11, you know, uh, 2,200 pounds. That's, that's not a big deal. It can pick up 2,200 pounds. Uh, yeah, it, it, it probably can. I have no doubt about that. Uh, but here's the problem is you're in an overload situation. Uh, you're not the manufacturer. You can't make that decision. That decision doesn't fall on your shoulders. The manufacturer designed the unit to, to handle a specific capacity. And really, if you go over that, then you're in danger. Uh, also, you could be damaging the, the hoist. Problem is, is a lot of people get that false sense of security because they may do something like that, and essentially they, quote, get away with it. Uh, so it gives them that false sense, well, hey, we can do this again. The thing that they don't realize is when you overload something like a hoist, you've taken some life out of it, and eventually what's going to happen is, is you do that enough of times, that hoist will fail. Unfortunately, nobody can tell you if you overload it 10 times, it's going to fail on the 11th time. Nobody can do that, all right? And that's what makes it so dangerous. It's, it's the unknown, all right? Overload, anything greater than what the rate of capacity is, all right? Pretty simple, all right? Uh, design factor, this is what I was talking about, what the manufacturers build into these different types of units. ASME HST-3, uh, 1999. Uh, it says that the unit has to be able to uh, withstand certain loads. Well, it does. Uh, they also put a design factor in there of four to one, which basically means that if you have a unit that is a one-ton capacity unit, it's going to take at least four tons of force for that unit to fail. All right, the thing is, is that design factor is not in there for you to use on the occasion where it's like, well, it's a one-ton unit. I know it's got a four-to-one on there. Well, I can, I can lift up a little bit more than a ton when I need to. It's not what it's there for. It's there for the normal wear and tear of that unit. Every time you use it, even though you're, you're picking up either capacity or under capacity, you're taking a little bit of life out of that unit, all right? And that design factor is only good when that unit is brand new. So as soon as you purchase that unit, and you use it the very first time, that design factor actually goes down a, a minute amount. It's no longer four to one, it might be 3.999, have 100 nines in there to one. All right, and then you use it again, and it's gonna go down a little bit more. As long as you don't overload it, that unit, and you take care of it, you do the inspections the way you're supposed to, replace the components when they get worn out, that unit will last a very long time and it will service you very well, all right? So don't sit there and think that, well, if, as long as I got a four to one design factor, I can overload that every once in a while. That's not what it's there for, all right? I just wanted to make that clear because a lot of people, uh, a lot of folks that I've dealt with in the past, uh, that's exactly what they do is they're like, well, I know I can get a couple more hundred pounds out of this thing, no problem. And it's like, well, you can, and you probably will get away with it, but one day it won't. 
you're not going to get away with it. Well, that's such a good point you bring up, Henry, because, yeah, that's how the units are designed for safety and not not the way people think it uh, should be used. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. Uh, markings uh, on levers, on lever strap hoists. Uh, one, obviously, the rate of capacity has to be on there. All right, the controls shall be identified to indicate function and direction, basically up, down, neutral. All right, identification, who made the unit? Uh, was it Columbus McKinnon? Was it some other company, company XYZ? The model number or the serial number has to be on there as well. All right, this is one, one of the little topics that people get a, a little bit confused on is that everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but there's, there's some folks seem to think that a serial number is mandatory, and it's not the case. Uh, model number or serial number, either one. All right, uh, warnings. The warnings have to be there. All right, they have to be on the unit. Uh, if they're obscured, uh, you can't read them because the, maybe the, the, they're illegible. Uh, lever tools get tossed around a lot because they're fairly small. Uh, they get thrown into uh, toolboxes, they get thrown into job boxes, they get thrown in the back of trucks, they get bounced around, a lot of the labels and things get scratched or scarred and you can't read them anymore. Label's still there, but I have to be able to read it, otherwise that information on the label is useless to me. All right, so it has to be there. Um, the capacity has to be on there as well. The do's and don'ts, uh, obviously don't lift people, don't lift loads over people, don't operate with twisted or kinked or damaged uh, chain or uh, a damaged strap or damaged roller chain. Uh, if the hoist is malfunctioning in any way, obviously don't use it. Uh, don't operate it in anything other than its manual mode. If it is a lever tool, I don't know of any lever tools that are powered. Uh, so they're obviously all manually operated. Make sure that a person is operating the unit. And when I say a person, I'm not saying a person with a cheater bar. All right, cheater bars are not allowed on any lever tool. Uh, manufacturers make the handles a certain length because you get a, you get, it's a lever, okay? You get a mechanical advantage with that lever. If you increase the length of that lever, your mechanical advantage increases. Problem is, is you haven't done anything to the gears or to the lifting wheel or even the lifting element, whether it be a strap, chain, or, or uh, wire rope, that hasn't changed. So you're putting more force on it. You're able to possibly pick up more load. Problem is, is now you, you're starting to damage the unit. So again, you could, you're going into that design criteria, that design factor, and you're, you're basically whittling away at it. All right, and of course, like I said, removing or obscuring any of the, any of the labels Big, big no-no. Uh, a lot of these labels are basically stickers, and one of the things that I don't understand with why people don't replace the stickers, stickers are not that expensive. Even if you go back to the manufacturer to purchase them, they're usually not that expensive, and it's a it's a cheap form of insurance. I like to say because uh, if you get if you get if you have an accident. And one of the things that they find out that that particular tool's label was missing or obscured, uh, yeah, you're going to get hit with a fine. All right, it's simple as that. And they, whether it had anything to do with the accident or not doesn't really matter. Point is, is there's some something amiss here? Okay. So hoist not in regular service. A hoist that's been idle for a period of a month or more, all right, but less than a year, shall be given an operational test. Basically, it's like, you know, if you, got, if you have a car that's sitting in a garage or in a warehouse for a long time, uh, what, that's probably one of the worst things that you can do for a vehicle like that. It's a piece of equipment. It's a machine. All right, machines don't like to sit idle for long periods of time. They need to be operated. They need to move. All right, in this case, it's a hoist. It's a lever hoist. All right, check the functions of the hoist. All right, make sure that they're working before you uh, put a load on it. I'll go back to that car that's been sitting in the warehouse for a long time. Uh, are you going to just get in it, put the key in it, start it up, and drive out the door? Probably not. You can probably get in there, test, check the battery, make sure the battery's okay, maybe even start it up and let it run for a little bit. All right, make sure the oil and everything circulates through the engine. We're asking you to do the same thing with, with any kind of a lever tool. After testing in the unloaded state, 
a load of at least 100 pounds. So we're going to put 100 pounds of weight on this lever tool and just run it up the uh, run it up the chain or run it up the strap. All right, just, that's all we're going to do. All we need is 100 pounds of weight per drop of chain or per drop of strapping. In other words, the load-bearing component, if it's a strap, chain, or uh, wire rope, if I have a single drop coming down, I'm only using 100 pounds. If I have two drops, 200 pounds, three drops, 300 pounds, and so on. All right, so that's that's pretty easy. I'll go back to the car. You know, once you get it running and it's sitting there and you're going to let it idle for a little bit, now you're going to probably take it out, run it around the building or something, and maybe go out in the parking lot, drive it for a little bit. You're not going to go up on a highway and do 65 immediately. All right, why? Because you're not 100% sure of what's going to happen. So these these are some of the things. Just a lot of this stuff, you, you know, you might look at it and say, well, it's all common sense. Well, it is, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't exercise that common sense. All right, a hoist that's uh, not in regular service. In other words, it's been idle for a year or more. Basically, the same thing. We're going to check all the functions and mechanisms, make sure everything's working right, everything's aligned properly. We're going to look at the unit, make sure there isn't any damage. All right, look at the latches that are on your hooks. Okay, hooks for hoists have to have latches. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That latch has to be functioning properly. All right, uh, hoist chain. Make sure it doesn't have any nicks or gouges or anything like that. Uh, make sure the reavings are proper, okay? Because a lot of times, especially on multi-reave units, especially on double reave units, that lower block can kind of get twisted between the chains. So if it's been idle for a while, and especially if it's been stored on a cabinet or on a shelf or something, that's what can happen. All right, uh, make sure you check the lever. Make sure it's not bent. All right, uh, I don't know of any manufacturer that makes a lever tool that has a slight bend or twist in the, in the lever itself. It just doesn't happen. All right, make sure that the supporting structure of the hoist isn't damaged either. All right, load testing. You've got to load test the hoist at least 100% of what it's rated for, all right, up to 125%, no more. All right, there are some people that want to say, well, I go up to 150%. I'm sorry, you're in an overload condition, all right? Other people are like, well, is there a set standard for how much time I have to leave it at that load? No, there isn't, all right? It's basically once you reach, the, once you reach your 100%, the, basically, the, the test is over. If you want to go up to 125, you can do that. All right. Whenever you do a load test, you have to document it. All right. A static test or a dynamic test is acceptable. All right. Those are the only two tests that you could do. All right. And these are some of the components. These are all load bearing components of a strap hoist. Uh, you can see the frame, the wheel. Uh, the ratchet wheel, that's where the strap gets real, you know, uh, reeved up onto. We've got the upper hook. We've got the lower hook. We've got the load pins. You've got the paw. All of these components are load-bearing. Same thing with these. This is a different model. All of these components are load-bearing. All right. Load test all your parts, okay? Anytime uh, with lever tools, there are so few parts in the lever tool that are not load-bearing uh, I mean, if you want to just put a blanket statement out there that says whenever you repair or replace any uh, component on a, a, a lever hoist, uh, load test it, I would venture to say that's probably going to be about 75 to 80 percent of the time that'll be correct. All right. But make sure that you have the facilities to test your hoist. And the nice thing is if, you've, if you can test one, you can pretty much test them all. All right, it's just a matter of, uh, of, of making sure that you have the machinery or the weights to do it. Henry, I'd like to go ahead and do a quick polling question, if that's yes. okay. Okay, so just a question. What ASME standard covers lever hoist? Is it ASME B30.9, B30.10, B30.16, or B3021? You all can just vote and uh, capture your responses. That would be great. Boy, it looks like it's uh, all over the place, Henry. Hmm. But people are leaning towards ASME B30.21. That would be 65%. correct. 
All right, I'll go ahead and close. It looks like 20% are for uh, B30.9 and and the other bulk are for uh, B20.30.21. Uh, Can you share the answer? It is 21. 21 is correct. Uh, nine covers slings. Uh, what was the other one? 16? 16 covers uh, powered units and, and hand weights. And what was the other one? 10? 10, correct. And 10 covers strictly hooks. Okay, very good. Okay. All right. Very good. Also, also in the inspections, frequent hoist inspections, uh, make sure that you look at them. Um, strap hoists or uh, strap lever tools, uh, they're nice. They're fairly light all right, because of the strapping. Uh, they can handle fairly significant loads also because of the strapping. Uh, and that's what makes them attractive. All right, thing is, is you do have to do a frequent inspection. A frequent inspection is a pre-operational inspection. What that operator is looking at is making sure that nothing looks strange. Uh, it doesn't look out of the ordinary. Look at the hook. Uh, make sure the hook doesn't have any damage. The latches are, are there and that they're functioning properly. Make sure it doesn't have any chemical damage, cracks or worn components. All right, make sure that the levers aren't bent. All right, damage to the hoist. Uh, if you have a, a hoist that has chain in it, look and make sure that the chain is not damaged. Uh, the really, really important part uh, about strap hoists is they are subject to cuts and abrasions pretty quick. All right, because the material, it's just, it's just the nature of the material. If you don't handle it properly, they, you can cut them, you can uh, abrade them. Uh, one of the things that people, I see a lot of people do is they'll take the lower hook and they'll actually wrap that around the load and use the strap in the hoist basically as a sling. That's not what it's there for and it's not the way it's to be operated. All right, so make sure that you're looking at all those different. Like I said, this is a pre-operational inspection. Some people call it a uh, operator's inspection. Uh, but it's bottom line is it's it's a frequent inspection, even a daily. Some people call it daily or pre-shift inspection. Uh, call it what you will, uh, but in in the standards, it's called a frequent inspection. And then we've got a periodic inspection. A periodic inspection uh, starts out as a frequent inspection, but it takes it one step further. And basically what it says is if there are any components of the unit that can come off, uh, that and that would be done by a, an appointed person to take the unit apart and look on the inside. All right, that's what they're looking for. They're basically taking it one step further. A pre-operational or a frequent inspection, you'll know, usually take you a, maybe a couple, three minutes. Uh, a periodic inspection can take you, oh, maybe half hour to an hour or more, depending on how big these units get. All right, but that's a uh, periodic inspection is, is you're going to take that frequent inspection and you're going to build on it. You're going to check the internal components. Uh, you're going to start, you may even have to take the unit apart and look on the inside, the gears and whatnot. Inspecting a chain for stretch. Uh, you can do this a couple of different ways. You can get the manual out and look and see what the manufacturer says, the distances between a measured number of links. Uh, Two and a half percent is usually what is acceptable, or I should say not acceptable, but that's the limit, all right? Uh, or you could take a, a piece of chain that's on an unworn section of the, uh, of the, of the unit, of the lever tool, all right? And it's usually the, what we call the dead end. There's usually you know, maybe uh, six inches to a foot hanging there that never sees any load and it doesn't even go into the hoist. All right, so make sure that you check that. That has to be checked. That's usually done uh, not by the operator. That's usually done during the periodic, okay? Operator handling the load, the hoist shall not be wrapped around the load. That's I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, and that's where a lot of people, they'll take that lower hook, and they'll wrap it around the load, and they use the uh, chain or uh, webbing for an actual sling, and it's not what it's there for. The load shall be attached to the load hook by suitable means, uh, attaching it to a sling of some kind or some uh, swivel hoist strings or some other attachment, some pad eyes, all right? But make sure that those points are rated for lifting. All right, the sling or other devices shall be properly seated in the bowl of the hook. 
We don't want to see tip loads. If the hook does not fit into the opening that it, that that opening is designed to pick up, then the hook needs to be taken out of there. We don't want to uh, maybe put a shackle in there. Uh, so then, then then attach the hook to the shackle or via another sling. All right, but those are different things that can be done. Uh, but if the hook isn't seated properly, do not lift it. All right, um, the load should not be applied to the point of the hook. That's what I'm talking about, tip loading. All right, before applying the load, the operator should be sure that the lifting medium is not kinked or twisted. A lot of times, uh, operators will get kind of all caught up in the picking up the load or attaching the, the hoist to the load. They don't look at what they're doing and what the hoist is doing. And what I mean by that is if you look at it, you'll see the chain twisted. You'll see the strap twisted. You're introducing a torque into that lifting medium. That's not what the way it's designed. It's designed to be pulled in tension. All right, there's not supposed to be any torque on it. The hook shall, uh, shall not be operated unless the chain is seated properly in the sprockets. Uh, and that's true with anything. You can, when you start getting twists in there, you, can st you could actually snap the chain if you leave it in there and it starts going into the pocket wheel incorrectly. It could actually break. Uh, you've got a strap. You could actually uh, start winding the strap up on the, on the uh, take-up wheel wrong. All right, so those are things that you want to be aware of. The hoist shall not be operated until the load block chain and hoist body are directly in line with the direction of the load. We don't want to side pull things. All right. Simple rule of thumb, upper suspension, lower suspension has to create a straight line. All right. Which, which way that line goes really doesn't matter. But as soon as you break that straight line, uh, maybe you're going around a, 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 another part of the load or maybe you're going around a post. Uh, or you're going around a pipe or something, and there's a little bit of a, an angle in there, the, you are no longer capable of pulling 100% load. Uh, you could be side loading. All right, so you want to make sure that uh, the upper suspension and lower suspension are in a straight line with each other. Um, Henry, just so you know, we have about 10 more minutes before we yep. take questions, okay? Okay. Uh, the hoist body of the frame shall not bear against any object. So, again, the hoist body itself has got to be free to move around. The operator shall not release the hoist until the ratchet and pawl is engaged. All right, that's pretty common sense. You want to make sure that you, you release the load uh, under control. You don't want it to come down quickly or out, of, or out of control, I should say. The operator should not allow the load of the hoist until the operator and other personnel are clear. Obviously, we don't want to hurt anybody, so make sure you bring it down so that nobody's in the way. When starting to lift or pull, uh, the load should be moved a few inches at a time. The hoist should be checked and proper load uh, holding action. So a lot of times you'll see crane operators will do this. They'll pick the load up maybe a foot or so off the ground, and then they sit there and they let they see what's going on. That's, a, that's, out, that's all that we're really saying is you don't want to take this thing and start picking it up because if you pick it up high enough and quick enough uh, and it's not seated properly, you'll lose the load. And obviously it's going to come down uncontrollably, not a good thing. All right, a hoist shall not be used to lift, support, or otherwise transport people. I think that's that's pretty much common sense. Everybody knows that, unfortunately. There's still a few people that will do that. All right, the operator shall not leave a load unattended. All right, we don't want to leave loads hanging there and then, and then come back to it You know, a couple, three minutes later. That's not what hoists are designed to do. All right, and OSHA specifically forbids leaving a load unattended. So here you can see we have a piece of roller chain. If you, you can see this, this one's been magnified a little bit. Uh, you can see this has got a crack in the side plate of the chain itself. Obviously, that's not a good thing. Here you can see uh, some link chain that has marks on the shoulders. That's indicative of the fact that the pocket wheel is making contact with that area and it is starting to wear. Question is, is why is the pocket wheel making that why is the pocket wheel making these marks? Well, if you look at the link where the links bear, where the link comes together with the with the link in front of below it and, and under it or above it, um, you'll see there's also some wear marks. Well, that means that that pitch from link to link is starting to get longer. And the pitch that's on the pocket wheel, it does not move. 
So if the chain is starting to elongate or the pitch is starting to wear the chain links longer uh, and that dimension changes, now it's trying to sit into the pocket wheel and it can't. That's what those marks are coming from on the shoulders where you see the red arrows. Here we've got a, a, a paw that you can see how it's worn. You can see where it's got a little bit of a crack in the middle there. And of course you can see the wear marks on it. That would need to come out of service. This one is pretty obviously it's broken, all right? This one here, you can see the threads in there are kind of worn out. That's actually for the uh, removable handle, all right? And here you can see the, rat, the, the, the ratcheting mechanism itself, the, the gears that are on there, the teeth. You can see how this one's got a big chip in it. That needs to come out of service. All right, here obviously this one's bent. Somebody probably dropped it or threw it down to the ground for whatever reason. And these can, some of these components are only made out of aluminum. So, um, and there, you can see that wall's fairly thin. So it doesn't take a whole lot for it to, uh, to fail. And here you can see a lot of the teeth on the ratcheting mechanism itself are pretty worn out. Again, Paul, it's got some damage to it. Here someone took a handle, they actually cracked it, uh, and then they welded it back together again. Again, a big, big no-no. Uh, the threads that I showed you in that one photo, this is the, the component that actually goes into those threads. You can see that the top part has a knurl on it. That's the handle. That's the part that the person actually operates. And then we've got the threads down below that, and then there's a pin below that. Well, all this does is this holds the handle in place. All right, so we don't have to put a whole lot of force on this thing to make sure it holds the handle in place. The threads screw in, they stop. You can't go any further. Making it, you know, putting a pair of vice grips on there and tightening it up even more, all you end up doing is damaging that knurl up on top and then maybe even stripping out the threads. So be cognizant of what you're actually doing and what some of these components are supposed to be doing. And that's because that's what will end up happening is that hole will get, just get stripped out. Here you can see a worn out hook. This is a little excessive, but it happens. All right, so you want to make sure that you look at your hooks, make sure you don't see something like that. That's from tip loading. You can see how the, the tip of the hook is, is pretty, you know, got some distance between that and the latch. These are different types of hooks. The ones that you see that have the uh, little rings on them are for hot, uh, for hot applications. So if you're using a strap hoist as a lineman and uh, you need a hot, uh, you're, you're, you're handling energized power lines, you're going to want to see a hook that has an eye on it like this. The other ones are made for standard, standard units. All right, so strap hoist, uh, severe wear, end connection, distor distortion of the web strap structure, evidence of heat damage, those are all indications of a bad strap. Here you can see we've got some uh, a piece of strapping that is not great. These are the things that you want to look for, any kind of heat damage, acid damage, welt spatter, uh, broken stitching, tears, damage, abrasion, knots. All right, one, okay, here's some uh, uh, straps that we tested. All right, these are the different types of things that we tested it on. All right, here we had one that had burn on it and then we pulled it. It failed at a little over 20, 2,200 pounds. It should have failed at 8,000 pounds. So you can see how that little bit of burn affected that strap. Here's a similar strap. Uh, again, it should have failed at eight grand. Uh, it, didn't, it failed a little over 5,300 5, pounds simply because of that little side cut. All right, this one failed at a little over 3,500, had a knot in it. Uh, it should have failed at eight grand as well. This one, eight grand as well, actually failed at a little over 2,200. Why? Because it had a cross cut going there. So you can see how some minor damage can actually influence the strap itself. So, you know, just again, be aware of what you're doing. Uh, be cognizant of the, of the hoist itself. If there's something that's strange or something looks weird on the unit, question it. Don't just say, oh, that's okay. It'll be, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It's, that's not you. You want to worry about it, okay? Yeah, those were some. Uh, those were some great examples. Um, 
because yeah, you, you think that there's just a little nick or a little burn and it's not a big deal, but the fact that we were able to test it and really show how it's compromised um, the life of the of the strap, but that's, that's really great. So before we go to questions, please go ahead and start typing them in now. I'd like to launch uh, one more polling question. Um, what is another name given to a frequent inspection? Is it pre-use inspection, operator inspection, pre-operation inspection, or all of the above? Again, what is another name given to a frequent inspection? Henry talked quite a bit about it a little while ago. Boy, Henry, you did well. I heard you <laughs> specifically speak to this point, and it looks like about oh, a little bit mixed, but I'd say 6% uh, for pre-use, 6% for pre-operation, and 88% say all of the above. So can you share the answer? It will. It is all of the above. So it, it, this is kind of a trick question. Everybody's got it right. Uh, simply, you know, some people call, call it a pre-use inspection, uh, pre-shift inspection, but they're all frequent inspections. The proper term that you're going to see in OSHA, CSA, you're going to see it in the ASME standards, they refer to it as a frequent inspection. Uh, so... What, what we refer to it out in the field, uh, however you want to call an operator inspection, pre-operational inspection, pre-shift, daily, uh, there's probably another half a dozen different terms out there. Uh, they're all frequent inspections. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple questions that came in. One of them is, can hoist hooks be used to collect slings? They can. If, it had, if you have some kind of like a, an, an eye, on a uh, strap, on a strap sling, uh, if you have a master link, uh, you could use it there. You could use it with uh, a shackle. So yes, it, the hooks can attach to multitudes of different types of things. Okay, excellent. Um, and there's another question that's coming in, which we'll get to in a second. Um, while while that person's typing it in, let's just if you can go ahead to the next slide, please, Henry. All right, we just want to speak. Do you want to go ahead and talk about this upcoming class that you set up in Nashville? Sure. Uh, we, we have a new facility in uh, Nashville. It's actually in, uh, uh, outside of our warehouse. Uh, it's just outside of Nashville. Uh, it's, if you drive from the Nashville airport, it's probably like a 20-minute drive. But uh, it's a nice facility. We just opened it up. Uh, we've already had one class there. Uh, worked out really, really well. Uh, what we do there is we do our uh, CM uh, utilities class there. Uh, it's going to be held in Nashville. It's a one-day class. Uh, it's basically going to take what we talked about here and get into it a little bit more elaborately. Um, but it, uh, it's a nice facility, and like I said, it, uh, we're looking forward to doing more classes there. We've, we've already sold out a couple of our other classes that we have there, and uh, this utility class is one of the ones that we're we're, we're looking to uh, to fill in there as well. Yeah, you can register for that class at our website. It's a training website, training.cmworks.com. I'll send you all a link to it following the webinar. Um, and we offer a, a ton of training. Henry teaches quite a bit, and we've got um, a few other trainers that teach around the country. So, um, like I said, you can look for that in a follow up email. So we got another question. Henry, can the hoist be used on a hot wire, and does it insulate the user? There's that's that's what I was talking about. Those hooks. Yeah. Uh, if you remember that slide I had with the hooks that had the eyes welded to the back side of them. Yes. Those are for hot applications. All right. Obviously, there's extra precautions that you have to take uh, in order to make sure that the uh, operator is is not electrified. Uh, one of those things is, is those eyes are meant so that you have basically what they call a hot stick. And it's basically a, a non-conductive bar mm -hmm. with a hook on the end of it, and that's what, they, that's what they'll use to grab onto, onto that eye that's on that hook. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the really important part is those, just because it's got a strap, don't automatically assume that it's, it can be used for energized power lines. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you, Henry. Well done. And if you can just go to the final slide. 
I'll just let you all know. So in case any of you are on social media, we're very active on social media. And there is one more question. I will come back to it. Um, but we are on uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram. So connect with us there. If you go to our website, cmworks.com in the upper right-hand corner, we have icons that take you to all of our different um, sites, social media channels. And lastly, that green one that you click on will take you to our blog. We have over 200 articles covering a whole variety of, um, you know, educational, educational articles covering a whole variety of topics in the um, material handling industry, utilizing our products, and just in general. And we do have a whole section there on utilities. So look it up, please. We encourage you. Uh, so one other comment and question came in. So let's see. So with this eye, how does the user release the hook with the latch? All of the ones we get in are taped. We repair to functional. Well, normally that hook will be attached to, in some cases, what people call a pork chop, which is basically the, uh, uh, the gripping tool for pulling wires. And you don't, you know, the, the, the gripping tool the, uh, will have an eye on it as well so that you can open and close it. So the hook isn't what is actually attached to the wire, to the, to the energized wire. It's actually what, what I, you know, like I said, what a lot of people call a pork chop because it resembles a pork chop. Okay. That's what's going to be attached to the hot line. Perfect. So taping, taping back the, the latch is not something that I would recommend. Okay. All right. Thank you, Henry. We appreciate that. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As I said, you can look for a link to the recording um, in your inbox in the next day or two. So hope you have a great weekend. And thanks again for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.